Hi all. I thought I'd uh, continue the evolution of chess style series and we're going to have a look now at Steinitz and his important theory of the game which kind of revolutionized how the game was played. Um, if you go to part 18 we're looking at Morphe, a couple of game examples of Morphe and he was um, an example of a combinative play, you know, playing lovely combinations which were crowd pleasing. Um, often the defences, uh, you know, weren't you know, very good. People would accept a peace sacrifice, but they didn't need to accept further sacrifices. And um, Steinitz uh, basically, by the way, he invented, you know, the title of world champion. Um, so he, in effect, became the first official world champion. Um, it was said that, you know, Morphe was the strongest in the world, but um, he wasn't so ready to accept match challenges, apparently. But I want to go on to that later. I want to first emphasize what was the theory that Steinitz proposed and it is true to say that Steinitz uh, was initially following the traits of his era as a combinative player, but he took like 10 years off and then came back and played this, the first official World Championship match against Zuckertort. But he had actually beaten Zuckertort before his theories. But here is his theory, which um, is very interesting to consider. It has a massive impact on the evolution of chess style. Basically, he states, and this is from, from David Hoover Steinitz Fury, at the beginning of the game, the forces stand in equilibrium. In other words, it's going to be a draw with best play, and we start off totally equal. So correct play on both sides maintains the equilibrium and leads to a drawn game. So basically, we're only winning because of mistakes from the opponent. If the opponent was playing um, the absolute best play, all games would be a draw. Maybe there's some evidence of this. In ICCF computer-assisted correspondence chess, there is an increasing number of draws um, as stronger versions of Ribka are being used. We, we can see that evidence in high-level computer-assisted correspondence. So maybe this assertion is true. Correct play on both sides, maintain it will be a draw. Therefore, a player can only win as a consequence of an error made by the opponent. So there is no such thing as a winning move. So all those winning moves you fought, that's only because there were errors. This is the same with, you know, the instructed games I often choose. They are often GMs versus IMs or against, you know, much weaker players because it's easier to get the losing moves from such games rather than if both players were playing absolutely brilliantly and solidly. It's less likely to get instructed games. So all those instructed games, really, they're revealing to be instructive. There had to be a major error. And um, as, as far as the, the, the really ruthless strategic crushes I've been showing you, a lot of the errors I, I you know, have been in pawn structure management and fixed pawn structures like Bolzavsky hole, things like that. So, so that's where um, there's been some, you know, fundamental s static factor errors. So long-term aspects of the position. But anyway, let's go on to point five. As long as the equilibrium is maintained, an attack, however skillful cannot succeed against correct defence. So really, Steinitz was emphasising now about defence, and it had been poor in, in this romantic period of chess. You know, a lot of the brilliant combinations um, were not that sound. Even, I think, you know, the immortal game, you know, white didn't have to sort of... Um, sorry, black didn't have to accept both rooks, maybe. You know, th there were defensive resources available. So... The assertion is, such a defence will eventually necessitate the withdrawal and regrouping of the attacking pieces, and the attacker will then inevitably suffer disadvantage. So it's basically saying, if you do try an attack and you haven't got an advantage, and your attack is repelled, you're actually going to stand worse after. Now this really assumes that, you know, you have got the skill and the resourcefulness to defend, so you need a certain... Uh, you know, resourcefulness and, 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 and strength. But uh, let's go on to point six. Therefore, a player should not attack un unless he already has an advantage caused by the opponent's error that justifies the decision to attack. In fact, for me, my most dramatic, you know, witnessing of a change of style uh, of a grandmaster, I was looking at James Plaskett the, the year before he won the British Championship. He didn't do so well in his attacks. They were, like, refuted like with central counter-attack. It seemed the year after they were more positionally oriented and his attacks worked. You know, he won 
the British Championship. But it's like, you know, he's a bit of a, you know, attacking hacker, sort of modern grandmaster. But, you know, he, I think he did play more positionally the year he won the British Championship. So his attacks weren't so repelled. Um, at the beginning of the game, a player should... So, point seven. At the beginning of the game, a player should not at once seek to attack. Instead, a player should dis seek to disturb the equilibrium in his favour by inducing the opponent to make an error. It is a preliminary before attacking. So basically trying to get you know, an advantage. And when a sufficient advantage has been obtained, a player must attack or the advantage will be dis dissipated. So these are the fundamental you know, things which uh, are, are part of Steinitz's theory. And in other writings, in the 10 years he had off to, to sort of look at chess in an abstract way, um, he did actually define many aspects of what he considered to be an advantage. And I hope you can review the static versus dynamic uh, thought process videos, because I'm, I'm actually going to go back to one of those now with paint, because we're going to have a look at what Steinitz means by some of the you know advantages in terms of positional play so Steinitz you know positional play if we remember Philidor Philidor said the pawns are the soul of chess between Philidor and Steinitz they're two of the you know the early great philo philosophers about positional thinking and these are things which they're not affected by calculation if you make a weak pawn move you can't retract that pawn move that's why not only you know, are these like the slower, more static features of the position? They're also, you can do permanent damage to the position. And so, so calling them static is also, you know, maybe it's an understatement. I'm going to refer to Kotov now in some of the elements which he attributed um, to, to Steinitz after mentioning Steinitz's uh, rules. Kotov had a different version of Steinitz's rules, and he reiterated them rather confusingly. But he mentioned things like, so the slower features, weak squares and pawns, open lines, the centre and space, piece position. So that's a grouping of elements. Well, in the first grouping, you have definitely the, the slower features of the position pawn structure, because pawn structure implies weak squares and pawns. So the other groups a kind of more dynamic, you know, open line, central and space, peace position. However, Steinitz wasn't just referring, you know, to positional advantages. He was referring to dynamic advantages as well. So the, these are two types of thinking. You think, you might ask now, what is the relationship between this and advantages in terms of positional and tactical? Well, if you play um, good positional play better than the opponent's, as a result of this type of thinking, the fruit of that will be a positional advantage. If you're better tactically than the opponent, then the fruit of that might be, you know, uh, uh, dynamic advantages. Okay, let, let's go back now. So this is the theory of Steinitz. And if you, you consider yourself a modern player, in inverted commas, you ascribe to... The, this, this theory, you're at least aware of this, this theory, that you don't go attacking so much now if you don't have a justification for the attack in terms of an advantage, basically. Um, and there's a fascinating paper I have found this morning which, which talks about uh, both Philidor and Steinitz it's called Steinitz and the Inception of Modern Chess by Federico Garcia. And he wrote it in December 2003. I'm not sure who he is. Sorry, I should have looked it up. Maybe he's a grandmaster. But I recommend you do a Google search on this paper. If you're interested in the evolution of chess style, have a look at this. Because really, he's talking about um, basically Philidor and the pawns, Anderson and the combination, Steinitz and positional principles, Nimzovich and the hypermoderns. Now, to understand Nimzovich and the hypermoderns, we need this background about what is the modern school set by Steinitz and, and, and Philidor to, to, to an extent. So this is a brilliant paper, which I have taken some time 
to have a look at. And I hope you can do a Google search on it and have a look. And after the theory, I'm going to take a concrete example game from Steinitz's first World Championship match. I've already done a video of the first game before. I'll try replying to this video with that as well. That, that was the first Slav game. But I'm going to show you an isolated Queen's Pawn demonstration with Black. In game 7 and 9, he won the black side of an isolated Queen Pawn against Zuckertort. So I'll show you one of those next. And then we'll continue on to the theoretical background after. Please leave any comments or questions so far about the theory put forward by Steinitz. I'll be very interested in hearing your views and questions on this theory. Thanks very much.